Warpugs, when Godzilla attacked, I mean, do you remember, like, you have to ask somebody that was old enough if they remember what it was like when Godzilla attacked Tokyo for the first time. Like, everybody remembers where they were that was alive during that period of time when they realized that a giant nuclear lizard was attacking a major metropolitan. I was there in all my glory. Not really. I'm not that old. Anyhow, um, but Drakenfell is going to illuminate us on what happened when the Imperial Japanese Navy performed its last stand. Now, after the war, the Imperial Japanese Navy was pretty much torn up, but um, they still tried to fight back against the beast, and I can appreciate that. War pugs. Salute to Drakenfell. He's going to be down in the comment section. Well, in the comment section below description. I'm an idiot. Um, everyone knows this, but here's the thing. Okay, when you watch this, just remember those that went, so we could talk about kaiju's. Okay, just remember that. Remember this is where it all started, and. Just remember, it almost came to a crashing halt when whatever was pretending to be Godzilla attacked New York and um, Ferris Bueller saved the day. God, I hated that movie. Anyhow, let's go. Let's get into it. If you don't know what I mean by that, look up the Godzilla trailer for 1999 and you will understand it was the worst. Would you stop trying to type the people on my computer keyboard? My work keyboard. Jesus Christ. Let's go. Wednesday rum ration. Do you feel the manliness of this? It's intense. Yes! Let's go. On the 23rd of October 1944, the Japanese cruiser Takao was struck by two torpedoes from the USS Data. Crippled, she limped back to Brunei and was then moved on to Singapore, where she joined the cruiser Miyoko. Here she would be further damaged by limpet mines from the mini-submarine HMS XE-3, which compounded what was considered already to be irreparable damage and thus the vessel was left as a floating anti-aircraft battery until the surrender of the local Japanese forces in late September 1945. After inspection, she was slated to be sunk in a live fire exercise scheduled for late 1946. However, the summer of 1946 saw the nuclear tests of Operation Crossroads catch not just an array of test ships in the fire, but also one rather strange amphibious dinosaur-style reptile. Alive with absorbed radiation, the already quite large and powerful creature began to grow, and, enraged by the blast, set upon and sank the submarine USS Redfish, before heading out in the direction <coughs> of other ships which you could hear coming and going, presumably on the basis of having heard ships arriving before the bomb blast along that vector, and connecting the two via cause and effect. Faced with the loss of several more ships, and escalating tensions with the Soviet Union, the US Navy found itself in something of a quandary. The rapid demobilization of the US fleet in the aftermath of World War II meant that whilst there were plenty more replacement ships available in mothballs, reactivating them would take some time, mm -hmm. and then crewing them and sailing them across the Pacific would take more time still. And even if or when this was accomplished, replacing the... I can't wait. The losses so over. recently suffered in order to shore up the deterrent effect on the Soviet Union would be the wider strategic priority. Yes. Thus, whilst sharing information on the approach of what would soon to become known as Godzilla, the US Navy was not able to offer any immediate assistance to Japan to deal with the incoming threat, at least in the form of actual warships. However, Japanese officials recalled that a number of Imperial Japanese Navy warships were still around, 
and they appealed to the US for permission and funding to help reactivate some of them. As the US was at this point more flush with cash than ships in the Western Pacific, this was agreed. A number of ex-Imperial Japanese Navy destroyers still in home island ports were allowed to be reactivated, and over in Singapore, the US saw the chance to score a triple win. Mm -hmm. There was a proposal to help pay for the accelerated repairs to the Admiralty 9 floating dry dock and King George VI graving dock, both of which had been damaged by Allied bombing in the latter part of the war. This would provide aid to an ally, the United Kingdom, whilst also meaning that the British would owe the US a favour. And we really took it out of the British for uh, World War II. I mean, a lot. It Lindley's cost them a lot, let's just be honest. It would also mean that these two large, well-equipped dry docks would be available for use by US Navy ships operating in that part of the world, and, in the more immediate term, it would facilitate the repair of the more modern of the two ex-Imperial Japanese Navy cruisers there, since Miyoko had already been taken off for scuttling. Thus, Takao, previously deemed irreparable, but now possessing enough funding to make her at least vaguely operational, spent about nine months having her hull patched up, her weapons made operational, and some machinery restored to working condition. In late April 1947, she was released into the custody of a Japanese crew. Only about half her power plant was functional, and a number of more specific systems, such as most of the ship's radios, her main fire control computer system, and others, were non-operational, since these were specific Imperial Japanese Navy manufactured items that the British dockyard workers had no manuals, parts, or spares for. What can you do? Additionally, most of the rangefinders had been broken or misaligned by the shocks of torpedo and mine explosions, and once again, these specialist parts weren't available in Singapore. The plan was to sail the ship back to Japan, where these and various other key components would be sourced from what was left of ex-Imperial Japanese Navy stocks and infrastructure. This would then allow Takao to lead a small formation of the aforementioned destroyers in defence of the country. Mm -hmm. It was something of a minor miracle that she was able to set sail at all, but the work had been spurred on by the news that a number of US Navy ships were in the process of being recommissioned, and once in service they would head across the Pacific, and they would need access to the Singapore facilities to address any issues that their time in mothballs and a long voyage across the world's largest ocean might have caused. The longer... I don't know why this is, as far as these things go but if you put if you put machinery in mothballs and just don't turn it on for like six months the thing's gonna break down almost instantaneously the second you flip the switch on it it's kind of weird like that why does my cat look like that what is your problem what is your problem oh my god why are you looking around like that it's because I yelled at you about the keyboard. Are you mad about that? Stop trying to... Oh, God, here we go. Takao we go. duly set out, but nearing the Japanese coast, her crew received signals via their remaining basic radio equipment that the Godzilla creature was somewhat ahead of schedule and was currently in the process of being engaged by a pair of small minesweepers. Mm -hmm. Proceeding at her best speed... Takao was able to witness the surviving minesweeper detonate a mine in the creature's face, and it seemed that her efforts would not be needed. However, a few moments later the creature emerged and headed for the minesweeper once again. With a limited crew, limited radio, and no long-distance central fire control, Takao's crew, already at action stations, could not inform the minesweeper of their approach, even if the smaller craft's crew would even notice their transmission in the middle of all the chaos. Additionally, without the benefit of central fire control and direction, or even working long-distance rangefinders, long-range fire from the main battery guns was far too risky. Although monstrously large for a living creature, the exposed portion of Godzilla was, at this stage at least, still a relatively small target as far as naval artillery was concerned, and of course the friendly minesweeper wasn't too far away. 
and thus the cruiser closed into point-blank range, allowing the guns to be effectively bore sighted using just the standard spotting scopes. The first salvo from the forward guns scored a number of direct hits, with the other shells passing close but doing nothing else but stirring up the water. Another salvo of six 8-inch guns as the ship heaved to port to avoid collision appeared to fatally injure Godzilla and secure the minesweeper. Some of the crew thus rushed to the ship's starboard side to see if they could spot any remains. Unfortunately, the wounded Godzilla was now mostly underwater and very angry. The sh I can think of a couple of things that would really piss me off. But getting shot with naval guns would seriously seriously being in like the top five of that so <sighs> you kind of get it don't you you kind of get it the ship had not been able to restock its torpedo launchers and it's somewhat questionable if such a close range salvo could even have been made to work in any case but a third salvo from the main guns proved once again quite accurate but with only the creature's dorsal ridges showing above the water the shells exploded in the water all around Godzilla without doing any further damage. Ah. Uh. Godzilla then burst out from the water, attacking the ship's forward superstructure and demolishing it utterly, the immense weight of the creature forcing Takao to heal heavily to starboard. Here, the lack of central fire control played into the ship's favour. Such a devastating blow amidships would otherwise have temporarily disrupted the ship's ability to fire, but since the turrets were operating under mostly local control already, the forward guns promptly slewed around and delivered six perfectly placed shots to Godzilla's flanks, following which it fell back off the ship with a roar of pain. For a moment, it seemed the battered Takao had just about scraped a victory, but it was not to be. Re-evaluating the threat the ship posed, Godzilla used an energy beam that would be dubbed a radioactive heat ray by Japanese observers to attack the ship from below. The massive energy unleashed mostly went straight through the ship and into the atmosphere, but the small amount that actually interacted with the vessel blew it apart. Most of the energy of this detonation came from the beam itself, but secondary explosions indicated that the ship's magazines had also been detonated. Rest in peace to those brave men and women. Well, at this point it was just men. Rest in peace to those brave men whose sons and daughters would eventually go on. It's, it's such a touching tale. When the smoke cleared, nothing but small bits of wreckage remained as testament to the valiant last stand of the Takao. Rest in peace. But the battle had apparently exhausted Godzilla, who retreated into the depths, allowing the minesweeper to escape its crew proving vital in stopping the creature later in the year using some of the reactivated destroyers, a bunch of gas tanks, and a cobbled together Shinden fighter. That's it for this video. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget- Guys, Dragonfell. <sighs> in the last stand of the Imperial Japanese Navy against the nuclear Godzilla. It, I must take a look and see some possible Q and A. Um, uh, Green Knight asked if the is the cruiser firing A P or H E at the creature. Um, where are all the carriers? Air power defeated King Kong should have been the obvious choice. Uh, let's see, let's see what else. How would Yamato or Nagato fare against Godzilla? These are these are amazingly good questions. Uh, let's see. God Guns and Battletech. You should do one on DD214. <laughs> Please do one on DD214. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Uh, hold on. Let's see. Some other good questions. What is it? Uh, let's see. Mm hmm I want to know how Godzilla fared against space battleship Yamato. That would be a really good one. On a scale of one to USS Johnson, would you rate the bravery of the crew of the Takao? That's really good. Guys, in the comments down below, on a scale of one to USS Johnston, okay? Tell me how, how, tell me how brave they were, okay? Um, let's see. 
So where was Godzuki during all this? Oh my god, that is a really good question. Why is the Bureau of Ordnance so bad? <laughs> Why is the Bureau of Ordnance so bad? The, look, they're going to be studying that like the Dead Sea Scrolls for all time of why the Bureau of Ordnance was that absolutely god-awful terrible. War Pugs, that was an April Fool's if it wasn't completely obvious. And it's a good one. I love April Fool's videos. I really, really do. Um, next year, I'm going to actually have to sit down and make one of my own. As far as a lore video goes, um, I'll have to decide what that's going to be. But Drakenfell really delivered with this one because, yes, 110% yes. Warpugs, I'm going to be putting all of his links in the description down below. If you want a great naval historian, just to learn a bit of history about ships, about naval battles, all that kind of stuff, I can make no higher recommendation than him. I really, really can't. I think he's the best. I think he's per just absolutely the best. Now, I'm going to step away from here. Check the links in the description down below for me. I'm going to find out why this cat looks... Come here. Come here to you. Can you explain why you just look so angry all the time these days? Please? Nothing? He's just mad. I don't know why. Just... I'll catch you. I don't know why she's so bad.